name is Caroline Afabek. I work for the Supporting Indian Trade and Investment Program, which is implemented by the International Trade Center. And we are funded by the UK's Department of International Development. We are facilitating the seminar today in partnership with the Confederation of Indian Textile Industry, CITI, the India ITME Society, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and the Ethiopian Textile and Garment Manufacturers Association. Ladies and gentlemen, during the next two hours, we aim to look beyond the current crisis and have an outlook into the near future, into the year 2025, five years down the road. In our panel discussion today, we will have panelists from the public sector, and I'm very pleased that we have the Honorable Cabinet Secretary Betty Miner of the Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development Kenya with us. We will have also institutional leaders business owners from across the industry and the development finance side with us. So they are putting forth their views on the textile and apparel market trends and on emerging opportunities for 2025 with an Indo-African perspective. So we will look into the question what it takes in a post COVID-19 environment to build a resilient industry that cooperates and that competes while delivering socioeconomic development. Ladies and gentlemen, before we go into our panel discussion, I am now very pleased to welcome you to the opening of the seminar. And our seminar will be opened by Mr. Ashi Shah, who is the director of the Division of Country Programs at the International Trade Center. He will be followed by Mr. Ajusha, who is the chair of the local textiles and apparel sector of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. And then we will have Hari Shankar, the chairman of the India ITME Society. And I'm very pleased that we also have Mr. T. Rajkumar, the chairman confederation of Indian textile industry. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to now hand over to Mr. Ashish Shah. Thank you. So thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, Your Excellency, Ms. Betty Miner, cabinet secretary at the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Enterprise Development in Kenya. Mr. T. Rajkumar, Chairman, Confederation of Indian, Indian Textile Industry. Mr. S. Hari Shankar, Chairman, India ITME Society. Mr. Ajul Shah, good to have another Shah with me, a local textiles and apparel sector, the chair, Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and CEO of the Kenya Shirts Manufacturers Company Limited. Mr. Goshu Negash, President of the Ethiopian Textile and Garment Manufacturers Association and the CEO of Vitcon Private Limited Company. Distinguished panelists, participants and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, namaste and jambo to East Africa, India and beyond. It is my great pleasure today to welcome you all to this webinar on the future of the textiles and apparel sector. Without any doubt, the global textiles and apparel sector has been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. Worldwide, orders along the textiles and apparel value chain are currently down by about 42%, while companies expect their 2020 turnover to decrease by 32%. Most companies expect to reach pre-crisis levels in early 2021, although some companies are more optimistic and are expecting a quicker turnaround. Today's webinar will look beyond the current crisis and explore future prospects from an Indo-African and South-South perspective. Over the course of the next five years, the global apparel market is projected to grow at a CAGR of 5.5%. This growth is partly driven by emerging consumer markets, including in Asia. 
At the same time, international buyers are increasingly diversifying their sourcing base to new cost competitive destinations, including East Africa. African countries, as you know, enjoy favorable access to key consumer markets such as the European Union and the United States, enabling savings of tariff duties of more than 30% on some apparel items in comparison to India. Also, the African consumer market is expected to grow rapidly over the next decade. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement, better known as the AFCFTA, entered into force in May, in May of, two, of 2019 and will provide market access to a combined population of more than 1 billion people, including through e-commerce. Today's webinar aims at identifying emerging opportunities in the African textiles and apparel value chain for African and Indian manufacturers and beyond. These opportunities are available to both SMEs and to larger companies. The webinar will also identify the challenges that need to be addressed, including by government. Finally, we will talk about the financing needs to build up a robust industry. Today's webinar brings together stakeholders from across the Indo-East African textile and apparel industry. We have policymakers, we have institutions, including financial institutions, and we have businesses representing the entire textile and apparel value chain, including textile engineering companies and manufacturers. It is heartening to see that many businesses present here today are targeting domestic markets, regional markets, and international markets using both traditional and new distribution channels such as e-commerce. Ladies and gentlemen, discussions and deliberations today can only mark a starting point. Let us set the tone today for deeper discussions on how the new normal will help shape further engagement and new partnership opportunities between India and East African institutions, associations, and companies to the benefit of a robust, integrated, and sustainable textile and apparel sector in the future. COVID-19 has clearly reminded us of the importance of resilience, but it has also showed that in adversity, there always lies opportunity. It is time for you, the stakeholders in this important industry, to seize the new opportunities as they arise. I wish to, of course, close by thanking our partners, the Confederation of Indian Textile Industry, CITI, the India ITME Society, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and the Ethiopian Textile and Garment Manufacturers Association. We value very much the collaboration we have had with you and the support we've had uh, with you and from you over the past years. And we look forward to further partnering with you on South-South trade and investment promotion and technology and technology transfer related initiatives. I also, of course, last but not least, wish to thank our funder, the Department for International Development of the United Kingdom for their commitment and support to ITC's flagship South-South Trade and Investment Program, and in particular to ITC's Supporting Indian Trade and Investment in Africa, better known as CETA, project. So I wish you very fruitful interactions during today's webinar, and I look forward very much to learning from all of you. Thank you, Danyavad and Asante Sana. Thank you very much, Ashish. I have now the pleasure to hand over to Mr. Ajul Shah, Chair of the Local Textiles and Apparel Sector of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers and the CEO of the Kenya Shirts Manufacturers Company. Mr. Ajul Shah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Caroline. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Hello? Sorry, yes, I'm having a lot of uh, you very challenges well. today. <laughs> we can hear you very well. It's all good. Okay. Please proceed, Mr. Shah.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we have lost the connection. Are you? Okay, I will try one more time. Mr. Shah, can you hear us now? I can hear you. Um, Fantastic. Sorry, I'm having to use my phone because my laptop decided to give me all sorts of problems just today. Uh, no worries, please uh, proceed. Okay, um, it looks to me that Mr. Shah has some technical issues. So may I please go then to Mr. Hari Shankar, Chairman of the Confederation of Indian, uh, Chairman of the India ITME Society. And we will come hopefully back to Mr. Ajul Shah in a moment. So please, Mr. Hari Shankar, the floor is yours. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Just to distinguished guests, panelists, ladies and gentlemen from around the world, a very good morning to you all. It is with great pleasure that I extend a very warm welcome at the opening of today's uh, webinar on the future of the textile and apparel sector with an Indo-African perspective. The objective of this webinar is for the public and private stakeholders to discuss how the global textiles and apparel sector will look like in the near future over the next five years in the post COVID world. The expected market, supply and trade dynamics and the emerging opportunities for both African and Indian companies shall be the main focus. We are fortunate to have an elite panel in our midst just to enable these discussions and to make and to map the way forward. This webinar also comes as a postscript to the recent, recently launched successful exhibition series, which, which is the ITNI Africa, which was held in uh, Addis Ababa at the Millennium Hall just this past um, uh, February. And in preparation to the exhibition uh, ITNI Africa, ITC, which is the International Trade Center, undertook a an extensive survey across 110 um, textile and apparel companies in East Africa. And the survey only confirmed that the large majority of manufacturers are interested in upgrading machinery, which in some segments of the value chain happens to be over 20 years old and hence outdated. Investing in new machinery will enable manufacturers to comply with scale and quality requirements and also to diversify both products and the range of markets. Also, absolute comp compliance with global environmental standards and practices will be the prerequisite in the post-COVID world going forward. The current um, COVID pandemic, as we know, has caused massive disruptions due to the rare shock caused by both the uh, supply and demand. Oh, we've had, as we know, production shutdowns and also supply chain disruptions. Although economies around the world are slowly starting to open things again, things expected to remain slow in the immediate short-term future. However, there is that old saying, crisis is also an opportunity. And so we should work towards expanding the African continent's future market and trading opportunities. African countries can build more resilient and sustainable economies if they can get a few things going following this pandemic. Firstly, it is very crucial to diversify African economies and to strengthen a few strategic sectors, one of which happens to be textiles and apparels, which as we know, has a key role in employment uh, generation and trade facilitation. Africa must also embrace the digital age and, to, and be able to adopt more and more digital technologies for both production and service. Finally, Africa must further strengthen intra-regional trade. The hope is for individual countries to make a consorted effort to harmonize their regulations, customs controls, and work to eliminate barriers in general also to help improve infrastructure and connectivity so that we can work towards lower logistic costs. 
the current crisis provides an opportunity to make more concrete steps towards realizing the African continental free trade area. With this in mind, I once again welcome all panelists and participants from around the world to join today's webinar on the future of the textile and apparel sector with an Indo-African perspective. Thank you very much, and I hand the floor back to Carolyn. Thank you so much, Mr. Shankar. I now have the pleasure to welcome Mr. T. Rajkumar, the Chairman of the Confederation of Indian Textile Industry. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning to all. On behalf of the Confederation of Indian Textile Industry, I welcome you all for this webinar and I'm extremely happy that Confederation of Indian Textile Industry has partnered with India and International Trade Center and SITA and with UK Aid for this seminar. Ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, on behalf of the Confederation of Indian Textile Industry and the webinar organization, I wholeheartedly welcome His Excellency, Her Excellency Betty Mania, Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Textiles, Trade and Enterprise Development, Kenya, and His Excellency Teka Gabriel, State Minister, Ministry of Trade and Industry, Ethiopia, and all other eminent panelists speakers, members from other organizations, and all of our listeners who are connected with us today from different parts of India and the world. It's a great honor and privilege for City to partner with International Trade Center, ITC, support of Indian Trade and Investment for our African Initiative, CITA, India Trade Textile Missionary Exhibition Society, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and Ethiopian Textile and Garment Manufacturers Association and UK Aid for partnering with City in organizing the seminar. Kenya, Ethiopia, and most of the East African nations have a very, very long relationship, traditional relationship with India for decades and generations. I hope that the seminar will be fruitful for the entire textile and apparel value chain of India and African countries. Friends, under the, guide, under the dynamic guidance of our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modiji, and our Honorable Union Minister of Textiles, Srimati Smriti Jubin Iraniji, and our respected Secretary of Textiles, Sri Ravi Kapoorji, Indian textile and clothing industry is determined to reach a market size of US $350 billion by 2025. And this again will only strengthen the partnership with India and East Africa because partnering with East Africa is the more is the important agenda of the Indian textile industry and government of India and industry stakeholders for working day and night. We all know the Indian textile and apparel sector is one of the oldest and traditional sectors and dates back several centuries. And it, is, it contributes significantly to the Indian GDP, around 3 to 4% of GDP and 11% of the Indian textile exports. And it also helps to have an employment of over more than 110 million people, including poor and marginal illiterate women of this country. It gives great livelihood to more than 60 million cotton farmers. And also India has 14% of world textile production and 5% of world exports. The same can be replicated in the East African countries. Again, because India and Africa has the same tradition and also has many customs and relationship as common. Keeping in mind India's rich heritage, abundant raw material, presence of entire textile value chain, skilled workforce and currently prevailing global trade situation. It will be a win-win situation for India and Africa to foster the economic ties in textile and apparel sector. Economic relationship between India and Africa has vast potential for growth given the obvious complementaries that exist between the two countries. Friends, ITC has been working with City for a very, very long time. 
I know, and the relationship ITC has with City, Saima, and other organizations connected with textiles, and it has been way back. I could say at least it's more than ten years. ITC, City, and the other organizations are working together. Woven fabric of cotton and cotton yarn are the largest exporters of the textile apparel commodity from India to African countries. <clears throat> Over the past few years, production of apparels have shifted from China to other competitive destinations like Bangladesh, Vietnam, Ethiopia, Kenya, etc. During the current pandemic of COVID-19 and with the prevailing situation over the world, a lot of major customers are willing to move away from their traditional manufacturing place. So India and Africa together can reap up the current situation and by working in this current correct direction, both countries can increase the trade of not only textile and apparel commodities, but other products as well. Ethiopia is one of the most favored destinations for apparel manufacturers among African countries and Kenya has been traditionally a destination for this too and is rapidly attracting foreign direct investments due to the benefits like stable political environment, developing infrastructure, large workforce, low wages in the country, many major textile and apparel giants like Arvind Limited, Raymond's, Ashton Apparels, etc., KBR Mills, SEM Textiles and others have already announced and moved uh, having investments in Ethiopia and other countries. City and ITZ have been successfully collaborating on investments and trade promotion between India and East Africa since 2000, including facilitation of investment promotion, visits from East African delegates to India, bilateral investment exploratory visits from India to East Africa. On the investment front, efforts have led of two large companies from South investing in garmenting plants in Ethiopia and have followed up to investment mission in 2017 and 18 under the collaboration partnership with ITC, supporting Indian trade and investments for Africa SITA program. India's KPR Mills Limited has set up a garmenting unit in Ethiopia's Mekali Industrial Park and this factory now produces close to 10 million items annually. It will provide job to 700 people in Ethiopia and can export garments to Europe and USA. So an example and it's many more to follow. Engagement between India and East Africa stakeholders is beyond investment and trade linkage. I'm glad to see that by now our initial engagement has also yielded in positive results at the farm level. In November 2017, the Southern India Mills Association, which is the regional association of the Southern Regional Association of the Confederation of Indian Textile Industry, had entered into a tripartite partnership agreement with the Ugandan Cotton Development Organization and the Ugandan National Agriculture Research Association on germ plasm exchange for improved cotton seed varieties. The new varieties will combine strengths of both the Indian and Ugandan seeds and benefit farmers in India and Uganda with, political, with potential impact of 3 million livelihoods in Uganda and the same can be implemented in other East African countries. I am extremely grateful to Bowen, uh, Caroline and many others who have visited many, many times to India and many special thanks to Bowen when Prasad who have been closely working with both City and Saima. I am extremely hopeful that India and African countries hold immense potential and if we work together, we can bring many good things in the textile and apparel trade between India and East Africa. And I'm sure the years to come will be a very, very fruitful years for both the countries. And I'm extremely grateful and thankful. Mr. Rajkumar, you are now on mute. I'm extremely grateful, I'm sorry, I'm extremely grateful to IDC, CITA, and UKA, and all others who have partnered with Confederation of Indian Textile Industry for this webinar, and I welcome you all for this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Rajkumar. I will now go back to Mr. Ajul Shah. I think he's now back, so maybe Mr. Ajul Shah, we will try it one more time now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Caroline. 
I'll try and um, keep this short just in case if I get challenges again. Uh, good morning to everybody. Good morning, Mashmiwa, uh, Madam Betty Maina. I'm very happy to ha uh, have you join us today. Um, I'll be very brief, very quick. Uh, we have about five or six textile mills in uh, Kenya. Uh, we have a very thriving uh, export uh, uh, promotion uh, uh, zone, uh, factories manufacturing garments for the US. Um, and uh, we have actually a growing, after a decline over a few years, we have a growing um, uh, sector in the garment manufacturing which is now, uh, which used to be mostly corporate uniforms, industrial uniforms, but we are now seeing more growth in um, uh, retail wear, where I think India has a great, great opportunity to come in and provide us with fabrics, uh, probably looking, look at setting up of uh, accessory, uh, making small industries here. Those are the things, the collaborations that we would like to see. Um, talking about having more of a collaboration between India and Africa, I think what we need to look at one of the things is how do we make it easy? Because we're used to the Chinese model where you have the Canton Fair and you have various cities like Evo and places like that where you go and get everything. This is, I'm, I visit India every year to do our purchasing. And this is one of the things I would like to see to make it easy for uh, African countries, African buyers, traders to come to India and easily source fabrics of different types, accessories, um, probably ev even invite uh, investment into Africa, into Kenya. Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria are some of the countries which are leading the way in the uh, fashion industry. And it offers a great potential for growth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ajul. So ladies and gentlemen, we are now coming to our panel discussion and we will have 11 panelists talking on various aspects and from different perspectives. So we will do one round of questions today, which will be followed by a question and answer session for the question and answer session, we will prioritize written questions. So I'm encouraging you to use the Q&A facility and to submit your written question as early as possible so that we can take your question into consideration. So um, ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to go into the discussion and as a ground rule for all panelists, so we will have enough time for discussion. I kindly request you keep it short, keep it up to four minutes, please, so that we have enough time for Q&As. So I'm very pleased to welcome our first panelist, Honorable CS Betty Miner. And Honorable CS, your ministry has been very active over the past weeks and months in supporting the local manufacturing for the domestic market. Um, you are also currently very much involved in the preparations for the negotiations on a free trade agreement between the US and between Kenya. And this FDA would follow the AGOA, the African Growth Opportunity Act, which will phase out in September 2020. And we know that AGOA has been an important agreement for the Kenyan garment exports because they enjoy duty-free access to the US. Let us also consider that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is to be launched in early 2021. So Honorable CS, against this background and from your perspective, what are the key opportunities emerging over the next few years for the companies, be they domestic oriented, be they export oriented, uh, be they locally owned or be they foreign owned? So what, what do you see is the emerging opportunities and what type of support from the government side would you offer for the industry including in question like environmental and energy costs. So over to you, Honorable CS. All right. 
Uh, thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, thank you to ITC and uh, KAM and uh, Simer and um, CII for the organization of this uh, webinar. I think it is quite uh, timely. Uh, drawing on the comments of Ashish uh, when he uh, opened uh, the meeting, uh, clearly outlined that there is a uh, you know there is a huge market uh, for textiles and apparel in the world uh, when I look around on the screen all of us are wearing some clothes uh, I don't think we made them ourselves I think we went to the store uh, to buy and uh, nobody is wearing something that looks like the other person at least so far what I can see so there is a great opportunity in the fashion and apparel uh, in the in the parallel sector uh, all over the world. Two, I think uh, one of the things that we have uh, established is clearly that uh, the, there's a large market and um, and, uh, and and most of that is being made outside the countries in which it is consumed. I think perhaps with the exception of uh, India and uh, and China, who tend to wear the stuff that they make uh, for themselves. So for us in Africa, for us in Kenya, we see a great opportunity to uh, supply uh, apparel products, not just for ourselves. I think the first market is of course ourselves. And we, in our case, one of the challenges we face is that we have a great market for pre-owned or pre-used uh, clothes that we are seeking to address. But as mentioned by Caroline, uh, the Kenyan sector, um, Ashish has also mentioned that, and I'm sure Pankaj would say that a lot of the apparels that are made in Kenya are consumed uh, in the US or in, um, in, uh, in Europe because of the preferential trade agreements that uh, we have reached uh, with Europe and, uh, with, uh, and with America and, uh, and Aragoa. We've recently done an, uh, a study and we uh, expect that even the Africa continental free trade area provides an opportunity for uh, the, apparel, uh, the apparel sector. So there is at least uh, three preferential uh, arrangements that we think we can um, utilize and uh, any investor in Kenya would have access to the local market and uh, those external markets and for export um, uh, for export products. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, Kenya has or, or doesn't have enough of is we don't have enough meals. Uh, we seek to have a vertically integrated uh, sector, but uh, in reality, of the nearly $500 million uh, worth of a Parts that were exported uh, to the U.S. Uh, last year by the from the export processing zones in Kenya, most of that, if not all, was made from imported uh, imported fabric. So we've long, you know, uh, aspired to have um, a textile mill within uh, more textile mills within Kenya in order uh, to be able to benefit. But those textile mills require, uh, can work from imported yarn, but also uh, could work from uh, you know, locally grown uh, cotton and other fabrics. So government focus in recent times has been to seek to grow and to uh, attract investment in additional mills or other you know, fabric, uh, fabric manufacturers. And that's, uh, that's something we would you know, be keen uh, to see. In terms of the investment climate, uh, Kenya has, has a lot of, um, has, has you know, done what many other countries have done. So it's not really very different in terms of setting up uh, focused uh, infrastructure through the export processing zones or what we are now working on on the special uh, economic zones. Um, we, we have heard uh, the comment that you made, Caroline, and it's a comment that has been made by other investors, which is the desire for cheaper, um, you know, a cheaper business environment with regard to electricity, with regard to logistics, with regard to water. And we seek 
uh, to do that. Uh, government uh, last year, uh, this year actually, has established that we'll have a you know cheaper power for uh, people who set up in industrial parks, especially in the special economic zones of you know five cents per per hour, uh, but no per per, per unit uh, you know electricity. But I also appreciate that. Uh, the electricity is not the only uh, motivating factor. I think uh, investors are encouraged to take the whole picture, and I appreciate what our colleague from Saima uh, uh, mentioned that we look, you know, investors look at the entire package. It's the cost of electricity, and it's the cost of our labor, it's the tradability of that labor, it is the potential uh, markets. So I think as we see the you know diversification in global uh, supply chains that are occurring as a result of COVID, we in Africa, and I'm sure my colleague from Ethiopia will confirm that we in Africa are setting up ourselves to benefit from this uh, global diversification, and we really welcome uh, the players on the call and other players to consider our countries because uh, we are set uh, for these uh, larger markets and uh, we have responsive, um, responsive governments uh, who wish to uh, make it possible for your investment to, to thrive. And for those who have invested in Kenya, I'm sure you can confirm that your, I mean, your, your investment uh, and you've participated in these market access uh, arrangements that Kenya has reached. A final one, and as I'm sure I reach my last uh, minute, uh, the Kenya is starting negotiations with the Americans on a free trade agreement as a mode and as a, as a, as a, uh, with an intention of securing uh, the market. The Africa Growth and Opportunity Act will expire in 2025, September. And uh, there is every indication from the U.S. so far that it shall not be renewed. And uh, given the fact that for us, the U.S. is our third largest export market, mostly driven by textiles and apparel, it's important that we send the signal to investors that we are keen on uh, securing this market. And therefore, it's not just, uh, I think it's not just textile, but I think uh, free trade agreements have proven that they have capacity to create a predictable environment for investors. And uh, this is something that we seek uh, to do. We start those negotiations in July, and we hope and pray that they will be successful and concluded uh, quite speedily to send that signal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable CS. I actually would like to take the opportunity to ask one question from the audience to you. So I will take this opportunity right now. Um, so Kenya has blue water access and good connectivity, good infrastructure, excellent workforce, yet power costs, as you actually pointed out yourself, um, are a bit on the higher side. Um, and that impedes, of course, the investment in textiles. In India, the industry has worked with government to reduce power costs through investing in green energy that can be offset against power drawn from the grid. Does Kenya have such a plan uh, which would boost investment attractiveness perhaps? So it's about green energy, the question. Thank you so much. Over to um, you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Caroline. And, um, Actually, I mean, well, the, the power mix in Kenya is almost 80% uh, green. We draw a lot of our power from hydro uh, and geo. And, uh, and that's something we continue uh, to encourage. But with regard to the specific question on whether manufacturers or millers can generate their own power and sell it off to the grid, yes, that is possible. The energy policy, uh, permits that, and uh, we have actually encouraged uh, businesses uh, to uh, invest. And there is a few who have already done that. Not a large amount, but you know, 30, uh, 30 megawatts or 
small amounts like that, but it is possible uh, to have a, a willing and 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 and, and, and off grid. Sorry, no, no supply excess power uh, to the grid from your own generation, and and that 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 that's so. The answer is yes. Kenya does have that policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable CS. We will now go to our second panelist. I am very pleased to welcome Mr. D. L. Sharma, who is the Deputy Chairman of City and the Managing Director of Wartman Yarn and Threats Limited. Welcome, Mr. Sharma. Um, my, question, my question to you is about a very recent success story by the Indian industry. So the global market for personal protective equipment is expected to grow largely over the next years. And within a period of two months, within a period of 60 days or so, India has, a, has become the world's second largest manufacturer of medical PPEs. And I think, um, you know, currently India is producing for the domestic market, but of course there is some expectations to export as well. So Mr. Sharma, can you tell us how India managed to become a key manufacturer for PPEs in such a short time? And what was and is the role of the government in this? And is there any lessons learned for the East African textile sector? Over to you, thank you. Good, I think, thank you. As uh, we discussed that you are very right that India could ramp up the production of PPE in a small time. Actually, as uh, historically we say mother, as the mother is the, uh, you know, the uh, necessity, the mother of inventions. Uh, you know, so therefore, uh, looking to the situation of uh, COVID, which was never expected, it's an unexpected event. And uh, medical textile, in any case, has been a field uh, where uh, the application of textile is medical. But when I think uh, the social distancing norms and, you know, uh, you know, keeping away from the touch to human to human, I think this was one of uh, the uh, trigger point to see that how to develop uh, you know, the the protective equipments, whether it is a mask or it is a coveralls or uh, caps or, you know, any uh, thing which required for uh, medical protections. So understanding that need, the industry really uh, uh, come up very fast. And even in small areas, like I belong to a place which is uh, up in the north, a place called Ludhiana is a uh, uh, part of Punjab state in India. And this is primarily a small, on in the knitting center of the country, like uh, one in South in Tripur. And uh, there are uh, hundreds of knitters, small knitters, and they make garments. And uh, they found that there's an opportunity in this to really participate. And uh, the, I think the government support was that immediately they institutionalized the uh, manufacturing in terms of the specifications, the standards, the approval processes, the research laboratory in terms of uh, giving the approval as well as giving the technical know-how uh, to the entrepreneurs. And as a result, with the initiative and the guidance from the government and to have the blessing from our Ministry of Textile and the Honorable Prime Minister, uh, uh, Mr. Narendra Modi. And uh, the, so the industry came up, in fact, uh, uh, you know, built products of PPE, which were almost one tenth of the cost, which if we would have imported from other countries like China or somewhere where it was available. So with the almost uh, a very, very low cost, uh, the entrepreneurs could respond to this request and uh, come up for manufacturing fabrics. Uh, you know, I belong to a company which is uh, one of the largest in India. Uh, it is a Vardhaman Textiles Limited. And uh, you know, that group, which has this subsidy where I am the managing director, 
Uh, so that company uh, actually base, makes yarns and fabrics of our types. So the fabric development came up with the, some technical support from the research uh, associations and uh, they gave the guidance in terms of the chemical treatment to be given to the fabric. Uh, and also then the standards organization which are there, whether it was uh, ISO or uh, any international standards which require to be met and for the purpose of certification. So with those kind of standard specification, I think the in-house development uh, and some support from uh, the outside, uh, we could come up and even uh, today, uh, as far as we, we have a small garmenting company uh, also as a part of Workman Group, and that company has only, uh, you know, made about over half a million uh, masks and uh, in the, another half a, you know, two, three millions of uh, the uh, overalls, uh, et cetera, and other, some of the technical uh, uh, PPs required like caps, et cetera, and, you know. So this way, and the, uh, the, uh, the small manufacturers uh, they have to a great extent diversified from making uh, the intimate wears or the undergarments or you know the t-shirts and diversified into the PP material, particularly mask. So mask is today a kind of a, a very, very cheaply available uh, anywhere uh, from these uh, small places. So uh, where the government support came in terms of standardization, in terms of the institutionalization of the approval processes and uh, the help to the industry in the form of uh, specifications, in the form of materials and those kind of uh, support, et cetera. So in fact, this was a new opportunity which uh, came up. Uh, we never uh, looked for that, but somehow because of the COVID and uh, this uh, unexpected uh, health conditions in uh, you know, a pandemic. So we uh, could diversify into PP manufacturers. So if there are any questions, I can. Uh, Thank you so much, Mr. Sharma. And I think you actually responded to one of the questions we had from the audience, uh, which is about uh, the challenges for the textile industry to meet the present expectations in medical textiles. And I think you pointed out that um, standardization um, and the certification was perhaps one of the key challenges, right? Yeah, that's true. And uh, we have the uh, South India Textile Research Association and DRDO, which is uh, Government Controlled Defense Research and Development Organization, and the Ordnance Factory Board which is a part of, again, the government of the, I think they diversified into quickly understanding the international standards from the international authorities and then putting them onto all came together and put them into make a India specific standard which would be required. So therefore they gave that set of standards which need to be met and they set up the approval process and uh, and identified uh, industry, uh, you know, the search association. Like uh, we have a South India Search Association, we have a Defence Research and Development Organisation uh, to uh, basically certify and some other authorities, and even in North India uh, Textile Research Association. So they will give the approval and uh, also guidance. Thank you so much for also pointing out the role, the important role in this process of the research associations. Now, I'm very pleased to come to our next panelist, uh, Mr. Pankaj Bedi, the chairman of the Apparel Export Sector, come and the chairman of the United IM. Uh, Pankaj, you know, your company is one of the largest garment manufacturers in sub-Saharan Africa, and you have also successfully invested along the value chain, including in West Africa. Um, what piece of advice would you give to 
a manufacturing company based in East Africa on how to remain competitive in the post COVID-19 environment. What are the top key points, the top three key points that you see that are important in the near future for manufacturers in this region? Over to you, Pankaj. Good morning. Good morning to everybody. Uh, my special regards to our CS Petty and, and special thanks to her for being very, very proactive in these tough times which country is facing. Uh, Carolyn, actually, this is a tricky question because, uh, uh, you know, I, I strongly believe that uh, we are all in the same storm, but in different uh, boats. And one size fits all is not going to work here. Uh, having said that, I, I, I thought maybe I would share our experience, how, what happened, uh, when, when, how we managed so far. Uh, maybe that can help uh, set some perspective for others also. Uh, so in, uh, in, in, in February, when, when China, uh, you know, lockdown happened and all that, uh, we started discussing in Delhi that if this happens in the U.S., how it's going to, you know, affect our buyers and how it's going to affect us and how we, our buyers are going to behave and how we should behave. And, and uh, we decided that, you know, it, for us at least, it would be important that we, we start thinking on protecting our value and our community because that's what we have created over the decades and 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 how we can continue you know supporting that value well value what we have created and then uh, we started discussing with our buyers and 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 we said that in case this happens in us how are they going to you know uh, continue and what are the, what are their plans and all that frankly they were also not clear uh, what's going to happen and how their buyers are going to behave and all that uh, fortunately, we discussed and we had an agreement and they asked us that what we would want to do. And we said, we are very clear. We want to protect our value. We want to protect our community. We have more than 10,000 workers and, uh, you know, with indirect jobs and, 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 and dependents and all that. It's a community of 100,000 people. So how they would be able to support us. And they said, uh, we, said we would want to just continue not to shut down. And, and uh, said that you, you cooperate with us also because uh, you know, don't know how things Anka, will Anka. Be. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. There seems to be a bit of an issue with your micro. Perhaps you try to go closer to it. Thank you. Yeah. So we we so our buyers also said that you know they would need cooperation from us, and we all agreed mutually that yes, we will for payments. We will work with them on changing styles, whatever they want. But the core idea was that we should, you know, protect our community, and and I'm glad that we did that. Uh, we we continued. We decided that we'll lose money by running instead of shutting down. And today I feel that I think we did the right thing by doing that. And uh, uh, now going forward, we see that uh, there would be a lot of opportunities because uh, you know the the. The whole sourcing is changing. The strategies of the buyers are changing. Africa has a great opportunity because uh, th there is a serious uh, strategy for Africa from a lot of buyers. We have good buyers in, in the region, like uh, we have gone to H&M and everybody. They're all very committed uh, to, 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 to the sector and to develop the, uh, the sector here. So I, I, I'm just hoping that uh, keep all the companies will believe in their own own experience, their own knowledge, their bias, their communities, and, and work hand in hand. And, and governments will also start thinking on, you know, looking at what kind of bounce back strategies we can have. We have been working with our government here to, to strategize what kind of bounce back package we can set up so that, you know, when the business starts and the markets open right now, though the US has opened, but it's going to take built up time. And, and we are very hopeful that way that you know, if we work together, we'll, we'll consolidate, we sustain, stabilize, and gradually come back. We have the experience of 2008, when the markets were in the similar situation, they were, you know, nobody had direction, but at least from there, uh, at least I can say that our company grew by four times. So there is hope, and we should believe in our, our experience and, and, and the skill and the community. And uh, hopefully we cross one day, we cross week, we crossed quarter now, and we'll cross the year too. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Pankaj, for pointing out that the relationship between buyers and the companies has been very important over the last couple of months. And it's about really working hand in hand also with the governments and for pointing out that, well, actually, companies are sitting in the same boat, but maybe um, from very different perspectives and there need to be perhaps different solutions. Now, I'm very pleased to come to our next panelist, who is Mr. Seruhun Abebe Gisaf of the Ministry of Trade and Industry, Ethiopia. Uh, he is the textile and leather director at the ministry. And um, so to you, my question is, over the past years, Ethiopia has gained a lot of attention by both international buyers who source more and more from this region, Pankaj mentioned just now H&M, for example, but also by foreign investors. And we have learned about that also during the opening remarks by Mr. Rajkumar, uh, who set up their units in the industrial parks to benefit from the duty-free market access and competitive costs. Now, um, so to you, my question, what opportunities and incentives will the government of Ethiopia offer to foreign textile and apparel investors in the next few years? And also, how does the government actually support companies in their post-investment phase? Over to you. You are on mute. Please unmute yourself. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Caroline. Yes, I can all. hear you. Good morning, all. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity given to me uh, to share my perspective on this important topic. And uh, I think it is a, a well time topic. Uh, in fact, the state minister was very keen to be in attendance, but uh, he was unable to be here because uh, he have a pre-scheduled meeting with the higher officials of the government. So uh, I received a message from him to express his gratitude to those who prepared this forum. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Hari. Uh, uh, we had a good uh, textile, textile machinery exhibition last time at the Millennium Hall, and we have a good feedback from uh, exhibitors and uh, from the government also. So uh, uh, we need this platform to be keep, and uh, from uh, our ministry, uh, we are very keen to support for the next program also. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to thank Mr. Raj, Rajkumar. Yes, we have uh, a strong institute because of your ITC, because of your support. This the, we have the Textile Industry Development Institute. Uh, most of the uh, experts and uh, uh, higher officials in that uh, institute, they have a capacity building in ITC. So we have a strong, uh, Institutes, so this industry is supporting our industries. Uh, saying uh, this, uh, uh, I need to to pass my greetings and my. Uh, I am very happy to see here also Mr. Hashish, our best co partner and colleagues, uh, and also uh, the CEO of Canary Africa, Mr. Hashish. Uh, uh, of course, we miss you uh, for the last three or four months. We didn't see you. Uh, Mr. Taka, His Excellency also miss you. Uh, he passed his greeting to, to you also. Special thanks. Uh, saying this, uh, yes, uh, we have, uh, when, when I come to your uh, issues, uh, uh, with full of confidence, uh, I, I can say, yes, we do have better, uh, different 
financial and the physical incentive package for uh, FDI. And that's why uh, for the last three years, uh, uh, it, it was 46% growth in FDI inflow. Uh, it is one of the most dynamic and largest FDI recent in Africa. Uh, maybe you have a report from the World Investment Report. So uh, the government is is taking the textile. This manufacturing sector is the top priority manufacturing sector. So that's uh, the commitment is coming from this view. So we have uh, we have different incentives, as I said, uh, like uh, physical incentives. Uh, custom duty, 100% uh, uh, exemption from the payment of custom duties and other tax left importers uh, is granted to all capital goods. We have also spare part worth up to 15% up to of the total value. Uh, uh, an investor who are entitled to duty free privilege who buys capital goods or construction materials from local manufacturing industry shall be also refunded from the custom duty paid for raw materials. We have also uh, income tax exemption for the investors engaged in manufacturing, uh, agribusiness agri generation. Uh, from between from one to nine years, uh, we have income tax exemption for the, uh, also, uh, and then we have, we have also non-physical incentives like loss carry forward, uh, ex we have also export incentive, uh, physical incentive available to all exporters include, with the exception of few products, no export tax is left on uh, Ethiopian export products. We have duty drawback scheme, voucher scheme, we have bonded factory and manufacturing warehouse schemes. These are the, those for exporter in incentives. Uh, saying this, uh, when we come to the this COVID impact, the Council of Ministers has recently approved several measures to stimulate the economy and support business survival uh, to address the impact of COVID, uh, especially uh, our bank and financing case, uh, the National Bank of Ethiopia avail 15 billion liquidity for private bankers to, to enable them to, provi to provide debit relief and additional loss to their customer in need. Even the development bank cut lending interest rates to 7.5% for borrowers in the hotel and manufacturing, including textile industries. Uh, they, are also, uh, they have also the soft loan add to other three initiatives uh, like engage in export, including uh, like horticulture and textile companies, two billion uh, soft loans for consumers, uh, loan repayment schedule for all its borrower. These also are uh, 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 to see for their liquidity problem of the industries. Banks also avail foreign currency for importers, primarily import goods and input material for the prevention of COVID-19. Uh, uh, in physical reliefs, uh, the tax exemption for the import of materials, as I said, uh, and equipment to be used in the prevention of and the containment of uh, COVID-19. Uh, our Ministry of Revenue also expedites the VAT returns to support companies with uh, uh, cash flows. Uh, in the in the case of the labor protocol, we have uh, a labor protocol with the Ministry of Labor, uh, associations, uh, and uh, association from both from the uh, from the manufacturers and uh, from the labor. We have a protocol. So uh, we ha in this protocol we have a collective bargaining agreement negotiation uh, is suspended for the coming. 12 months uh, and the salary increment decision are frozen for the coming 12 months. 
so uh, the government is uh, uh, is looking uh, uh, support uh, to 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 support companies from these uh, impacts uh, in respect of flights and logistics uh, export manufacturing industries uh, who do not use a railway service due to location distance will have a 50% discount export freight service also. Transport service also uh, uh, from the industry park to the port, uh, we have a 50% discount price and uh, also 73% discount from manufacturing sector export using the Ethiopian uh, shipping lines. Uh, our Ethiopia Djibouti Railway Share Company also uh, 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 transport export material from industrial parks and export manufacturing industries that come through Mojo Dry Port to Djibouti free of charge for the next three three months starting from the last May May first. So uh, these also are uh, and uh, we have also additional different. Uh, uh, incentives uh, committed from the government to motivate the industries and companies. Thank you. Thank you, Karoli. Thank you so much, sir. And um, also, thank you so much for touching on the questions around logistics, which I believe is always a very key question um, to look at. Now I'm very pleased to welcome our next panelist, Ms. Vandia Gichuro, who is the CEO and the co-founder of Vivo Actifair. Vivo Actifair is a retailing clothing business for the East African market, based here in Kenya, manufacturing here in Kenya. And Vivo Active has currently 14 physical stores. Um, I think you are you have started uh, in 2011. Vandia, I think um, your latest, your youngest baby, so to speak, <laughs> is Shop C2. Um, you launched Shop, Shop C2 in December 2019. It's an online fashion store that offers affordable African fashion, but also accessories and beauty brands. And uh, you feature there both your own brands but also you feature other African brands from um, African SMEs. And I'm actually very pleased to say that Kipi Peo from Rwanda, a woman-owned SME that produces kids clothes, and it's actually one of our beneficiaries, is also available online in your store. So, Vandia, I would like to know from you, what is your vision for Shop C2 over the next five years and you know how do your efforts support african smes over to you um morning thank you so much and uh hi to everybody thanks for having me um i think the the really the the experience that we've had with vivo in particular over the last nine years has shown the opportunity there is for local brands and especially brands that are designing to meet the local market. So we realized that there was a gap um, in terms of what, you know, the global fashion community really designs for a very Western, very European client. Um, and the Asian market is different as well. So there was a gap there that we have tried to meet and, and have um, whatever success we've achieved, I think is because of the fact that we design for this market. Um, so when we launched Shop Z2, what we realized was there is an opportunity to bring um, these brands together and support local designers, local manufacturers to really create brands. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep emphasizing this because I think there's power in brands and the ability for brands to connect with their target markets. Um, what I think is unique about what we're offering is it's a full suite of services. So it's not just your typical e-commerce marketplace, but we do handle content creation, we handle logistics, we do the distribution, we handle customer service. We will even support with product development. Um, we have, for example, digital printing services, so we can help brands to 
customize um, their fabric so that they're able to offer very unique products. We can partner with designers, with creatives um, across, across the market. I think what also is interesting is then we're able to bring down those costs. So we're able to bring down the costs of distribution and logistics and, and content creation, et cetera. Um, so yes, we're keen to, to carry brands from across the region. So mar uh, businesses that want to come into the Kenyan market from Rwanda, from other countries, but don't necessarily want to invest in their own infrastructure, their own uh, physical stores, we're able to help them get into the market. We can work with manufacturers. So we're speaking to large factories who traditionally have just created product for their clients. And what we're saying is, why don't you also think of creating brands that you can, um, we can help with the, with the market understanding to help you design for the market. You produce the products, but we will then support you on the distribution, the marketing, the content, the social media engagement, all the things that we have learned over the years can really help to um, support brands. And then of course, there are all the very many smaller brands as well. Companies have great ideas, um, fabulous products, but it doesn't make sense for each of them to have their own websites, to worry about their own warehousing and logistics and stuff like that. So if we can bring those together, if, I mean, I think for those of you who know Kenya, we're all familiar with the Maasai market, for example. There's no reason why some of those products can't be turned into brands that are then marketed across, um, not just Kenya, across the, across the region. So it's, it's looking at the local artisans, it's looking at, um, for example, those who are producing in the Uhuru market and places like that. How can they get their products across the retail market and even outside of Kenya. Uh, so when I think about five years from now, what I see is the opportunities with the app free trade, um, where we can see how, you know, how to bring products from other parts of Africa to Kenya and take Kenyan products across the continent. I'm very excited about the opportunities that e-commerce provides to do this in an efficient, uh, cost-effective way. Um, and because we're part of this group, I do believe as much as we will continue to develop um, our textile industry, I think the fashion fabric needs are so wide, so varied, that I'm very excited to support what Ajul said and to see how can we bring Indian um, textiles, Indian technology to support the production of our brands and the products that we're offering across, um, across our range. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vandia, for these very important points about talking about the brands versus a product and really also about the opportunity that e-commerce offers for the fashion industry um, within this region, but even beyond at a more continental um, aspect. Now, I am very pleased to go to our next panelist and to welcome Mr. Goshu Negesh, the president of the Ethiopian Textile and Garment Manufacturing Association. And please let me also reiterate that Ed Gamma is also our partner today. So in mid-February 2020, the India ITME Society facilitated India, ITME Africa 2020. And, um, you know, many of the participating Ethiopian companies expressed their interest in investing in new machinery. How important is it for your members to invest in machinery in a post COVID-19 environment? And what are the constraints, if any? Over to you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Caroline, for uh, giving me this uh, oppor opportunity to meet this webinar. Uh, it, I'm pleased to see Mr. Uh, Ashish of Canoria on the, on the group and Mr. Sudi too, and the other participants. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, the ITMA uh, that was uh, conducted in Addis has given the opportunity uh, to our members to, you know, see 
uh, new technologies that can be uh, brought into Ethiopia. And uh, as you know, uh, now technology has become very important. As you can see, we are able to communicate uh, from wherever we are, so that facilitating our interest. So technology will be very important aspect of uh, the, the, the textile and garment uh, sector in Ethiopia. Uh, so the, the, the first move that ITMA has, has uh, taken to bring its machineries to Addis has given the opportunity to our members to see what uh, technological, uh, technologically advanced machineries can be used in their future business development. So our members are very keen, you know, to uh, to, to cooperate with Indian uh, machine manufacturers so that they they they, um, they 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 use the advanced technology in every aspect of the operations, like in designs, in uh, processing, and uh, you know, in the uh, uh, in developing new products, like uh, what our colleagues are, our, our, what our colleague has said, uh, to develop, you know, new brand that fits the need and the requirement of the customers or, or the end users. So I would say this was a great opportunity for us to cooperate with our Indian uh, suppliers. And if uh, the Indian manufacturing um, machine manufacturers are willing to come and invest in Ethiopia, that would also give a great opportunity, you know, uh, to bring the cooperation to a higher level instead of uh, buying, you know, from, from India. Then that will uh, bring the cost and everything uh, uh, less than what would, uh, that what would be imported from, from abroad. So in my opinion, this was an eye-opening uh, program that uh, ITMA has opened. And uh, if, uh, the Indians are interested in uh, investing in Ethiopia, especially in manufacturing uh, machineries. That would give a, a great opportunity to our members to, to, to go for uh, better technology, machineries and facilities. I thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So um, I think that that shows that there is indeed an interest to invest in machinery and upgrade technology. Um, so it remains very much important. Uh, I would now like to move to our next panelist, Mr. Sam Chakbate, the CEO of Jumia Kenya. Jumia is the leading e-commerce platform in Africa it generates one transaction or lead every two seconds. And Sam, you have been with Jumia from its early days onwards. Uh, you have been responsible for the expansion of Jumia in different African markets. So you obviously know the e-commerce market on the African continent quite well. What is your market prognostic for the next five years, looking at the e-commerce market now in, in, on the African continent. How much will the fashion e-commerce grow? And what type of opportunities do you see from fashion manufacturers to reach new clients through e-commerce? Sam, over to you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, so as you mentioned, Jumia, Jumia is, a, is sort of an e-commerce leader across Africa. Um, we're in 11 countries today um, and with about 100 million unique visitors on our sites in 2019. Fashion is big in e-commerce um, in Africa today, um, though it does vary quite significantly across the continent. Across the continent on average, um, fashion sales account for 25% of e-commerce sales by volume and that's clothing shoes and accessories um, it's up to 30 percent of sales in leading um fa online fashion hubs uh in nigeria and egypt in particular morocco over indexes uh ghana over indexes um but it under indexes also in some large e-commerce markets such as kenya 
um, where the fashion share of sales is only 10% um, today. And the main difference, the main explanation of those differences from our perspective um, was already hinted at by, by CS, uh, CS Minor. Um, you know, one is the prevalence of the secondhand uh, imports. Um, and the second is the availability of, you know, at scale affordable um, fashion locally. Um, and that's, that's certainly our perspective on, on the Kenyan market. There are great manufacturers um, doing great stuff, largely for export. There are also great manufacturers um, doing stuff today, um, but you don't have, the, you don't have the scale today to, to, to reach the price points um, for local markets um, or the scale of production to support big demand. Um, we anticipate high double digit growth in online fashion sales um, across the continent. Um, you know, that's gonna be driven by, by the overall adoption growth of e-commerce um, across the continent. Um, and also by across a number of different you know, types of platforms, you know, large, large multi-category platforms such as Jumia, um, some specialist platforms such as um, One Year's Shop Zetu, uh, and also social selling um, platforms like Instagram, which, um, and that sort of, that, we're really excited by that actually. The diversification of offer is going to help, is going to be a catalyst for e-commerce growth. Because we need all of them. We need all of those different types. We need the different niches. We need the big platforms. We need the specialist ones. We need everything. But the, but the biggest opportunity, um, to come to your second question, the biggest opportunity that we see is in the, is in the growth of supply, um, particularly in the markets where it's, where it's lacking today. You know, E-commerce is a viable channel. It's an attractive channel for all manufacturers that want to, you know, one, build their brands, two, reach new clients and three, get paid at home because you're interacting with you know, professional organizations uh, with good payment terms, et cetera. And you're interacting with typically one or two you know, professional partners um, as opposed to many distributors or many different retailers which are harder to manage. Um, we think that the manufacturers that can hit the preference styles of the different markets and the price points are going to do great. And we really hope that that opportunity is going to be captured by local manufacturers. Uh, and in particular, those on the call <laughs> that are producing at big scale for export markets today, you know, there is a real opportunity for you today in Kenya and across the rest of the continent as well. So it's time to, to look at that and now more than ever. Um, and it's also an opportunity, e-commerce is a channel for, for cross-border um, e-commerce. Um, you know, e-commerce e is a great way to test and learn the different, different African markets, um, you know, to set up products, to ship products, you know, by the order if you want to, or to send, you know, low volume of, 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 of products um, into partners on the ground with warehouse, with logistics, who can handle all of that as, as one dear hinted as well. Um, today, Thousands of Chinese manufacturers do that already with, with us, with Jumia. And that's a big business. There are hubs set up in China where, you know, sellers very easily drop off and then we handle the logistics to get the stuff, you know, packaged, distributed across Africa, cleared and delivered to customers. We would love to do the same thing in India. Um, and, and actually also in African hubs. Again, like I think, wouldn't it be great if, uh, if, Ethiopian manufacturers could sell cross-border across the continent. Uh, wouldn't it be great if Kenyan manufacturers could do the same? So that's, that's the role that we hope uh, e-commerce can play in all this. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, and thanks a lot for really pointing out um, what type of opportunities e-commerce can offer over the next coming years. I am now very pleased to welcome our next panelist, Mr. Ashish Agrawal, who is the group CEO of Canoria Africa Textile. Mr. Agrawal, Canoria Africa Textile, based in Ethiopia, is the first eco-friendly integrated denim plant in East Africa, but actually also in the world. You know, looking back, have you been able to harvest a green dividend through price premiums for your output? 
Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, so good morning, Mr. Jerion, Madam Betty, Mr. Goshu, all the participants. Good morning to all participants from Africa and good afternoon to all participants from India. It's already afternoon here in India now. So let me just brief you, give you a brief history about the Kanoria group and why it decided to invest in Ethiopia and how this environmental came into the picture. Basically, Kanoria group is a chemical group in India. Kanuria Chemicals is a reputed uh, business house in India. In chemicals industries, we have jute industries, we are in automotive industries, we have a trading company, tea garden. It's a very diversified group. So the, our chairman was interested in investing in Africa. And finally, after the, all the due diligence, it was decided that we'll invest in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia has many other advantages uh, besides one big advantage is support from the government, which is a very big advantage, which uh, Ethiopia do have. There's a patient's hearing and the uh, action is taken immediately, which I've been personally experiencing in the last five years. Any problem you go, there is a solution for that from the government side. Besides that, there's the energy uh, sector, whether the power is cheap, abundant labor available. So that, that attracted us to Ethiopia and we have decided to get into Ethiopia. So when we went to our uh, chairman for uh, the environment, I'm coming to the point of environment. So the chairman was very clear on that matter that uh, we have to follow the group policy, the group philosophy, the way of life. So it's very clear whether we invest in Africa, whether we invest in Europe or in India, environment is our philosophy of our group. So his words were, we need to keep this beautiful country as beautiful it is. That was his words during the initial discussion, what we had with him. So we, we have seen in other part of the world, especially in Asia or wherever the textile has grown. Uh, if, if I talk 200 years before in Europe or today uh, earlier in Asia, the damage to the environment is there. Some damage are permanent in nature, some are temporary in nature from different sectors. And textile is one of the sector which is contributing to this damage to the environment. So then we decided that, okay, we'll put a zero liquid discharge, which was a very new concept for uh, uh, Ethiopia context, for the East Africa context, to have a zero liquid discharge, which was not mandatory uh, to have in the Ethiopia context as per the pollution control norms. So we went with a very unique technology, which is normally used in the pharmaceutical industries. So that technology is treating the effluent without adding any chemicals uh, and getting uh, the zero liquid discharge and recycling the water. So actually we are recycling 95% of the water. So whatever water we are using, 95% is recycled back. 2% gets evaporated in the system somewhere and 3% is converted into the salts. It's a very fine salts, which we are conducting trials with uh, leather industries to use in the leather, leather industry. It, uh, it is a sulfate salts. So it's a practically with zero discharge. Besides that, we had electric boilers. So there was no air pollution. So there was no air pollution, there was no water pollution, there was no solid pollution. So absolutely this was the company which had no, no pollution creating, zero pollution company in the world. The first any manufacturer. And on top of that, uh, Ethiopia is uh, supplied with the hydro power, the green energy. So we became the first green denim plant in the world with almost zero carbon footprint, almost zero uh, carbon footprint. So we became the first green denim plant in the world. And this is something which is the, basically we wanted to do it. It's our intention. What uh, I appreciate Caroline has asked, whether we get the premium from the buyer for that. Of course, the buyer has its own market. They are, they are tough, they, they, were, they have their own customers. So they don't give extra money for, okay, you have environment. You, they don't give you extra penny for that. That's, that's for sure but they really appreciate you. So we are working with the top end buyers of the world. We are working with uh, Indeed Zara. We are working with, uh, we we'll start with h &M. We are working with Von Pre Germany. So all these buyers do appreciate what you are doing and acknowledge that. So actually they're not contributing in terms of uh, the price. Some, somewhere they have that consideration, but they appreciate and acknowledge and consider you as a long-term partner with you. So this has to be there. And we, we are starting a industrialization, a new era in Africa now. And this should be a part of life. This should be the way we should start industrialization. 
not after a decade controlling the damages. And I appreciate right from the PM office, Prime Minister of Ethiopia himself, His Excellency Prime Minister, the earlier Prime Minister visited the factory, watched this water treatment plant, and everybody from the government appreciated that. And they have started the similar kind of technology in all the textile parks. So if you go to the textile park, Awasa Textile Park, or if you go to Bolivia, everywhere there's a zero liquid discharge now. So they have water treatment, the best water treatment plant. And we are proud to set up a new benchmark in the East Africa in terms of environment. So I think so. This is one thing which we have to consider as a long term. Definitely it will not pay in a short term, but this should be the way we should uh, do the manufacturing in Africa. Thank you so much, Mr. Agraval. Um, thank you very much for pointing out it's perhaps not about receiving premium prices, but it's still very, very important. And we have learned earlier this week from the buyers actually that it is for them nowadays a prerequisite to source um, also fabric. I would now like to move to the next panelist. I am very pleased to welcome Mr. Sanka, the president of the textile machinery division of Lakshmi Machine Works. Mr. Sankar, your company is a leading textile machinery manufacturer in India and you have started to the African continent in the late 70s. You have your office here in Nairobi since the early 80s. Um, from your perspective, what role does machinery play for the African textile and apparel sector in the near future? How do you see the market trends given that a lot of modern machinery currently idling is available at steep discounts. Over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Carolyn, and uh, Madam, Her Excellency, Madam Betty Maina, who has also incidentally visited our uh, facility in Coimbatore, and also uh, His Excellency, Mr. Zuren, and there are Gentlemen, I met them during the last show, which was held in uh, Ethiopia, the India It Me Africa exhibition. And uh, you have given the pre information about our company and our association with the African market, so I don't have to elaborate. And uh, I just want to give a small background about the, the trade, what's happening in the African side, which is closer to about roughly as per the last data, maybe post-COVID it would have changed. As of the last data, it's about 36 billion USD is the transaction which takes place both for domestic and the overseas market. That's what is the data shows. And uh, whereas the connectivity between the trade, what's happening and the facility, the infrastructure in terms of the manufacturing from the uh, spinning to the garment, uh, uh, I mean, spinning to the processing is not absolutely matched with that. That's what we could see as a gap. And uh, from the perspective of uh, the installation of the spindles, what the Africa has today is about 4 million out of it. Our uh, survey shows that 1.7 million is active, and out of that 1.7, 0.7 is in Egypt, which are active. That means literally there's only 1 million spindle which are actively in operation in the African continent. That's what we uh, see it as a point. And there is a tremendous opportunity uh, between India and the uh, African side to work together in order to create a self-sustenance to feed the garmenting which is likely to grow in the future as uh, you have a special uh, you know, relationship, trade relationship with uh, United States and EU. And uh, we estimate roughly you need a capacity for the African closer to about eight to 10 million spindles in the upcoming time in order to avoid the logistics of moving 
from one location to the other location because the logistic cost also is going to be very expensive in the future. Now, recently, uh, in the last year, we did an installation of an integrated plant in Kenya at uh, Eldoret. And that's been a wonderful experience between both the Indian side and also the Kenyan side, which was about, it produces about 12 million meters of the plot and uh, absolutely integrated uh, from the, uh, you know, spinning to the processing. And uh, it, not only we stopped with that from LMW side, we also did the skill development for the people who can contribute to make sure that the optimal results are obtained. So we have associated with the Mo University in Kenya in order to create the, uh, you know, the skill development training institute. And also we did a small training center in the Rivatex uh, factory where we have been able to showcase some of the uh, uh, miniature version of the machines so that the skill levels are developed. So my only submission here is if, you know, the raw material is available in the African continent, as we see the data is about 6 million bales of uh, cotton each of uh, 480 pounds. And I'm sure with the raw material availability and given a situation where if the power cost is uh, managed because next to, you know, in the manufacturing cost, the raw material and the power is a major constitution if the power cost is addressed uh, in the Kenyan side, whereas Ethiopia, it's already on the lower side. And if that could be addressed, and I'm sure the needs of the local in order to facilitate the government to be successful can be met with. And from our side, India, we have uh, excellent uh, technology and also which creates a real value for our end user and which can make them very competitive in the manufacturing cost and sustain in order to make sure the offering to the international markets such as US and Europe are absolutely positive from the African continent. And uh, also one more important thing is that the automation which may require can be decided by the, the user uh, country appropriately. If they are very clear about employment as a case, we have one type of technology. And if there is a full automation and with the digitization, that is also available from India. The Indian side is absolutely equipped to meet the needs of the African uh, textile industry from end-to-end -end solution. And uh, we have our uh, local office in Kenya in Nairobi, and they can always support the uh, industry very well from LMW perspective. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Sanka. I am now very pleased to welcome our next panelist, uh, Ms. Antje Steiner. She is the Director of the Regional Office for East Africa DEG, the German Investment and Development Company. Antje, you offer access to finance to textile and apparel companies in East Africa. And access to finance obviously remains the big elephant in the room. And we all know that companies more than ever actually are really looking for affordable access to finance. Could you tell us how you support the textile and apparel industry in the current crisis in this region, but perhaps also beyond? Over to you. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my great pleasure today to join you here uh, in this interesting discussion. Uh, yeah, rightly said, financing, um, especially short-term financing, is a very uh, big topic these days, very obviously. Um, but maybe allow me to start with two words, what we generally do, and then I can 
well, explain a bit on the COVID response situation and also how our vision is for the next four to five years uh, um, for textile industry in Africa. I think this was the general request for today. Um, so we are DG's the private arm of the state-owned uh, German state-owned bank. So that means we are financing, we provide long-term and equity financing for private sector companies. We do that sector agnostic. So in fact, in many different areas uh, globally uh, in the develop, uh, developing countries and also in the textile industry as said. So we have quite uh, a few years experience uh, in RMG financing in Asia um, and well could, pro could, could uh, accompany our clients in many countries uh, in, in, in this sector um, in Bangladesh but also China, Vietnam, also in India or especially also in India for many years. Um, and uh, we financed mainly capex um, expansion of production, but also uh, um, very interesting uh, the TA side, which means technical assistance for advisory services. I heard the um, impressive examples here before on the on the improvements regarding water uh, treatment and um, well all these uh, um, green. Uh, uh, topics which are very, which getting more and more important in the in the sector and also will be required and are required from the buyer side. So we did that and saw in the last years the trend to Africa. So we also are quite uh, um, yeah pleased to be in the position that we could even uh, um, uh, company clients which are uh, in Asia uh, to Africa as they also of course realize the trend to have a production in Africa and, and can you know make advantage out of that interesting text uh, landscape and, and other really uh, positive features. Um, so that's well the current situation and we are aware the textile sector is a very important sector for, um, for Africa regarding jobs, regarding um, creating income of course and uh, uh, being very interesting for the European and the US market. We, we see this very often. Um, on the COVID response, uh, the question was, how do we support the industry? So what we first did is having a look, a look, a look of course, at our portfolio clients, trying to find out where they have financial needs, what we can do. Um, here we mainly uh, were active and are active in two fields. One is, of course, the short-term liquidity support, as this is very obviously a topic now many clients experience. Um, where support is needed. And uh, B, we elaborated together on the TA side, which means how could we not just with financing, how could we also support regarding advisory services, sometimes directly financing uh, equipment, which was needed, um, which is needed, uh, you know, very, very precise things like masks and, and you know, oxygen e equipment, which also was, uh, is necessary these days. Um, so we try to be pragmatic here and just to, to support quickly without too much uh, complication in the processes, which is not always easy, however. Um, yeah, generally we, we do have certain criteria um, what, yeah, what we have to uh, ensure if we come to a financing. Uh, Caroline, you asked me earlier to explain a bit what DFIs do and what is the criteria list we need. So. Partly, I think it's already known. So, of course, we need some track record uh, in the market and some uh, um, experience which we can then simply rely on. We only are the bank, but the entrepreneur has to know the, the market and has to ensure, of course, the future of the company. Um, and, well, based on that, we elaborate together what could the financing be about? Is it about CapEx? Is it about um, a greenfield? Um, so, we, we are quite flexible in this um, aspect, but what is our um, special point is then to combine that with some um, yeah, developmental targets. So we do not only financing, it must be also some, some uh, developmental aspect in it, which is following our goal to uh, fulfill the, um, the SDGs, um, Sustainable Development Goals, which is I think all known also to you. And we have uh, special targets there, mainly about creating jobs uh, and also, of course, fulfilling clim uh, climate targets. 
and um, yeah, we elaborate then together and uh, well, a plan how to fulfill certain aspects in that. And finally, uh, the response we always got from our textile clients was always really good as they told us, well, it was quite an achievement and it was not easy for us at the beginning to follow these targets to fulfill it. But finally, it brought us really uh, on a, on a, on a well, higher level, obviously, and uh, a lot of positive acceptance on the buyer side as this is more and more a required uh, topic um, to have uh, qual regarding quality of the supply chain. I think we heard about this earlier here already. Um, yeah, and finally, I think the question was if, if we, uh, well, if we support SMEs, yes, we do. Uh, it's always a question uh, of, of definition, what is SME? But altogether, that's what we mainly do. We support SMEs globally, and uh, as I said earlier, also in the RMG and textile sector, um, also around the world. And we hope to do this um, even more, and also more in the next five years in East Africa. Uh, we have our first um, connections uh, started a few months ago in Ethiopia, trying to um, set up there uh, to provide support there in the sector. I heard earlier very interesting aspects here on tax support, on, on governmental support to make it happen that the industry can grow further in Ethiopia. And we, are, we really hope we can support that and contribute here from our side. Back to you, uh, Caroline. Thank you so much, Antje, for addressing this very important question about access to finance. I'm now pleased to move to our very last panelist, Mr. Navdeep Sodi, partner at Gersey Textile Organization. And Navdeep, my question to you this morning, because I also know that you have been very active in West Africa recently. So only 20% of the African Cotton is currently transformed while the rest is exported in, as a raw material. And at the same time, more than 90% of the continent's textile demand is met by imports. What, from your perspective, is the missing link and what is required to create a robust and integrated textile and apparel sector on the continent? Um, Nafdeet, over to you um, the last four minutes and then we will go into Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you, ITC, and uh, thank you, City. Uh, well, the development of the industry in Africa, I mean, it requires uh, a complete ecosystem or, uh, you know, what we also commonly refer to as the enabling the environment. Now, what is this ecosystem? What is this enabling environment? Uh, essentially, it has uh, five building blocks, as we see. The first building block of this ecosystem is the vision and policies. So this essentially means a political commitment to develop this uh, sector in countries and over the continent. The second building block is the infrastructure and logistics. So this basically includes, uh, you know, the electricity, energy, water, special parks, sports, and so on. You know. The third uh, pillar or the third building block is the investment. And the other side of the, the same coin is incentives. You know. Incentives are uh, vital to attract investment, both local investment and also the FDI. Now, what does uh, FDI bring? I mean, FDI essentially brings uh, three things. First of, of course, it's obvious it brings the capital. Secondly, it brings the technical know-how. And thirdly, it brings the market, that's the customer's know. The fourth building block of the textile ecosystem uh, that is needed to you know, foster the textile industry in Africa is the market access. Now, the market access, I mean, we all know that most African countries, they enjoy preferential market access to, to the developed countries, that's the US uh, and uh, the EU, but also what we need is, uh, you know, the regional and the local market access. So there's a great expectation that, uh, you know, the coming into force of the African 
free trade area, the Continental Free Trade Area, FCAFTA, which came into force in the May of 2019, will integrate the market of 54 countries. You know. So this will create a big potential for textiles to move seamlessly through the continent. And fifth, uh, building block of the textile ecosystem that we need in Africa is the capacity building. You know, we know that uh, you know historically, I mean, Africa has not had a big industry unlike other uh, Asian or European countries. So therefore, there's a need to create a skill set. There's a need to build capacity among uh, the institutions to the enterprises and also to the human resources in terms of skill building at the micro level you know. now what do we get i mean this is often the question of the policy makers you know what do we get if we do that so the benefits of this ecosystem can be actually uh, uh, translated into very simple uh, numbers the first benefit or the impact would be uh, that you know today we produce about two million tons of cotton in uh, Africa. This could be at least partially transformed. The second is Africa has a trade that is both import and exports currently to the tune of about forty five billion dollars per annum. You know, of which imports are twenty five and exports are twenty billion. You know, so there's a potential to integrate this with the domestic textile economy. What does it need? Obviously, that's the gap, you know. To convert even uh, half of uh, Africa's uh, cotton, that's about 1 million tons, into value-added uh, products, we will need an investment of about $25 billion until 2030. Secondly, this will result into exports of about 45 to $50 billion until 2030, that is in the next uh, 10 years, and that can represent something like 5% of the global trade in textiles and clothing by that time. And this would represent about 5% of the market, which is quite significant, you know. And most importantly, I mean, Africa is a young continent. There's youth and employment is needed. Now, this industry has the potential to create about 5 million new jobs over the next uh, 10 years if these things are uh, done, you know. And above all, I mean, this will help in integration of the African textile value chain, the supply chain into the global uh, supply chain, you know. I mean, in conclusion, I mean, uh, our company Gearsy, we have had a lot of experience in Africa. So I'm quite optimistic, you know, that in uh, today's uh, multipolar environment, multipolar global trading environment, the international buyers and the countries themselves, they have realized the potential they are taking steps in uh, this direction. I strongly feel that the momentum is uh, building up. So therefore, among the audience, I mean, whether you are a buyer or a seller or an institution, I mean, you need to pay attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think you raised a very important point that there is really an opportunity to create jobs at large scale, but it also really requires larger scale investment. I now would like to use the last minutes, and we have actually already reached two hours, to, um, to um, do a quick round of Q and A's, and I will now go into some select questions. I have one question for you, Honorable CS, um, from Deepak. In India, Indian government promotes modernization of machinery by offering capital subsidy under TUFs. Does Kenyan government offer similar incentive to foreign investors wanting to set up fabric manufacturing units in Kenya or beyond? Okay. Um, thank you. At present, no, we do not have a specific program on uh, machinery uh, upgradation uh, for, for, foreign, uh, for foreign investors. Uh, what we have done in the past, and um, um, uh, Shank, uh, Sanka mentioned that, is that we have invested in uh, uh, machinery upgradation for a local, a lo a lo a local mill because that is what we had. So I think if anybody has an interest in um, 
uh, a new meal in the country and depending on the offer, I'm sure that's something that we would be willing to um, review around whatever needs and uh, they present uh, they present to government. Thank you. Thank you very much, CS. I now have a question for Mr. Sharma. Um, the support ecosystem for the garmenting industry is almost non-existent in Africa. Is there appetite from Indian industry to invest in capacities for threads, labels, zippers, etc. So, my question um, is to you, uh, Deputy Chairman City. I'm just trying. I think he is currently offline. Um, he's on mute. He's on mute, uh, Caroline. Uh, he's coming on. He's coming. On. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Can you repeat? So, so, sir, I have a question from the audience to you. The support ecosystem for the garmenting industry is almost non-existent in Africa. Is there appetite? from Indian industry to invest in capacities for threat, labels, zippers, et cetera. So we are back to the question about investment into the African continent. Yeah, Caroline, you are asking uh, me? Yes, this was a question coming from the audience. And the question is whether you can see some appetite for investment, in particular in the yarn segment. I think we have heard that, you know, a lot of cotton is exported, but value addition is limited. So do you see that there is an interest, an appetite for investing in this segment? Uh, actually, yes, maybe, but uh, as, as far as the Vardaman group is concerned, because their uh, stated policy is to stay uh, only in India and the Vardaman exports yarn into, uh, you know, the all the countries, including the African continent. So because that is the major focus, yarn and fabric. Uh, so it is the only area is that base of manufacturing is always in uh, India only. And that too, uh, you know, in two states within India, in Madhya Pradesh and in uh, Punjab and uh, Himachal Pradesh. So three places we have uh, the manufacturing, but uh, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, they don't have any intention of moving outside the uh, you know India for the manufacturing operation. They are supplying worldwide. And if you now look uh, beyond uh, your own company, would you see? that there is an interest by Indian companies to look um, into future investments in the near future in yeah, this sector? Sure, I'll check up because I, along with Mr. Rajkumar, we are uh, in the city. I'm the deputy chairman, he's the chairman. And uh, whenever, uh, if, uh, you know, uh, from uh, the, uh, you know, if we get some communication officially to address to city and we can discuss with our members uh, whenever we have a meeting and uh, uh, can uh, promote asking them to uh, diversify those who, them, those who are interested uh, for uh, putting up uh, uh, the manufacturing operations uh, into uh, African countries. So we can okay. do that from city side. Okay, thank you so much, sir. I now have a question for you, Mr. Goshu. So, at Gamma, what is the domestic textile industry in Ethiopia doing to develop linkages with foreign investors to supply inputs such as fabric? What are the main problems that delay the upgrading of Ethiopian owned industry? 
So can you hear us? Okay, I'm afraid that he is not online, so I no, have he an... Is, he is online, he is online, he's on mute. Mr. Goshu, I can see him on screen. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yes, I can also see him on screen. Okay, um, here we are. Please unmute yourself. Sir, are you there? Uh, Karen, I didn't hear you good. Okay, um, I have a question for you from the audience. So the question for you is, what is the domestic textile industry in Ethiopia doing to develop linkages with foreign investors to supply inputs such as fabric? What are the main problems that delay the upgrading of Ethiopian-owned industry? Over to you. Okay, I am afraid that, are you, can you, could you hear the question, sir? No, sorry. No, 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 thank you. no, can you repeat it, please? So the question, sir, is, what is the domestic textile industry in Ethiopia doing to develop linkages with foreign investors so that the domestic textile sector can supply to uh, the garments units, for example, in the industrial parks. So wh what are you doing about that? And uh, what are the main challenges? Um, uh, you know, there is a weak link to be frank because uh, uh, the links that are existing between companies in the country are so weak, but we sometimes organize a kind of uh, meeting uh, where uh, buyers uh, can admit that uh, there is a, a weak link uh, between the two uh, parts of the sector. I mean, the fabric supply making garments. Okay, thank you very much for mm. your response. Um, I would suggest it is now past 11. I would like to do one very last round with each of the panelists who are still with us to have, uh, to have really one last, uh, you know, um, sentence on what is the future of the sector look like? So that is our wrap up today. So I will now open the floor for each panelist to have one last sentence. Uh, and I will start with Honorable CS. Over okay. to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Caroline. And thank you very much, ITC, for this uh, session. I think my last remarks also build on what um, Sam and uh, Wandia said is that there is great potential for this sector, both uh, for exports in out, out, out of Africa, but also uh, domestic sales. But I think it's important to take advantage of not just the uh, external markets and uh, trade agreements that our countries reach, but also uh, take advantage of e-commerce. Uh, I've been struck every time my daughter is online, uh, she's online shopping and all the stuff that she's looking at is obviously not available in the country. And I, uh, I'd have to tell Wandia that uh, she's actually ended up buying something from Shopzetu, uh, something for, uh, the, I think, one of your new lines for, for young people. And I think there's great opportunity to use uh, our young people's commitment and their own newfound uh, nationalism and focus on African goods to really utilize uh, e-commerce uh, to build up a, a large clientele in this regard. So I think the local textile industry can 
uh, innovate and meet the needs of these young people and use the channels uh, that reach them. Thank you very much. Thank you, CS. Um, over to you, Mr. Sharma, Deputy Chairman City, for your last statement, please. Offline, Caroline, move on. Okay, Pankaj Bidi, any last comment? You are mute. Yeah, hi. So I would say that, you know, we need to all accept the reality. We know what's happening and, and the challenges are there. We need to build up trust. Uh, we should also understand from the government's perspective that they don't lack intention, but they lack resources. So we should also, you know, not com continue complaining. We, we should be the part of the solution right now and not uh, the problem. Uh, we all know the problem. We all know the markets are down and everything. But there is great hope and uh, we should work together, have synergies, collaborate and, and try to rebuild and, and rebuild based on the new realities, you know, and the notions and all those, uh, uh, you know, over assumptions should be stopped right now. We should first all focus to stabilize like we do in emergency, stabilize, stop bleeding and start building again. There is great hope. Uh, I am a strong believer that Africa is in the forefront of benefiting from here uh, because of the whole sourcing pattern and everything changing. So I, I strongly believe that we should believe in our community uh, and, and also trust each other to, to build this. And, and government obviously is going to be a key player in this from the bounce back. And we continue to discuss with them, go with the solutions, uh, you know, and not only with the problems. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the last sentence, uh, last statement from Mr. Siruhan Abebe Gisaf, please. Please unmute yourself, sir. Uh, thank you, Caroline, and uh, all uh, panelists. Uh, we, ha we had a good time, and uh, uh, I myself, uh, I saw, I, I got a different perspective from you. Thank you. Uh, Hopefully we will have uh, we have uh, a potential untapped potential capital. Uh, we need to utilize this uh, potential, and uh, we. Uh, I am very happy to invite you all, uh, Indian investors and uh, uh, business partners, to come here and to to develop uh, this sector. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Vandia Gichuru, are you still with us? Do you have yes. a last comment? Um, just, just to say thanks again. And I, I think there's never been a, a, a time that we have needed partnerships as badly as we need them now. So I don't think uh, we can afford to, to try and work. We have to support each other. And I think there'll be lots of ways that we've not worked traditionally together that the, the future will allow us to do. So I'm very keen for anyone who's interested in what we're doing with ShopZ2, please contact us. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Goshen Negash, do you have a last message for the audience? Uh, yes, Caroline. Uh, yes, Caroline, I, I am there. Actually, you know, I'm not sure if I, my message is getting through because of uh, the network that uh, uh, I have. Uh, in any case, uh, I would like to appreciate the organizer in this platform, which gave, which gave us a good insight of what is going on uh, everywhere, uh, where our participants are coming. Uh, in, and uh, yes, we have to face the challenge, uh, do uh, exert our utmost efforts uh, to get through this difficult time of uh, the COVID pandemic and other challenges. And uh, I hope, uh, because we live always with hope, I hope we will overcome all the challenges and uh, get uh, to wherever we want to go uh, or to reach. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And um, one last sentence from Mr. Ashish Agrawal. Thank you, Anoria. 
ultimately what we feel that there is lot of potential and hope in uh, africa continent as such and east africa particularly so the industrialization will definitely grow and not only for the export market whether it's us euro but also once the treaty is uh, goes on this africa continent treaty free trade treaty which will be a big game changer in the entire world and this will help us everywhere the industrialization will be a big boost in the entire africa continent i think so personally after this treaty thank you thank you um then mr sankar please unmute yourself yeah uh, thank you carolyn it was very well organized and uh, you know i have gone through many cycles of such uh, dips in the past in my career and textiles we are fortunately in this uh, field which is next only to the food for the public and i'm sure the textile will bounce back that's my comment and i wish uh, everyone uh, uh, best wishes and i'm sure we can sustain and make it happen in the future time fantastic uh, nafti do you have a last comment nafti sodi Yes, thank you. Well, I mean, as we all know, the global textile industry is uh, undergoing uh, restructuring, and uh, in this, I mean, Africa has an important uh, potential. So, therefore, whether you are on the demand side or you are on the supply side, there is an opportunity. I mean, uh, you know, I can confirm this from our own experience because I mean, we have uh, a vast presence in this continent. I mean, we have uh, a lot of interest, you know, from the institutions. and potential uh, investors you know i mean my only hope is that the african governments and the policy makers they can really work towards creating an enabling environment and uh, you know foster the creation of the the ecosystem that the textile industry needs so we are optimistic that uh, the future for africa is bright it will take time and it will need uh, you know all hands uh, on the deck thank you Thank you so much. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining our webinar today and for listening. Uh, I think Mr. Pankaj Bedi wants to make one last. Uh, I saw his finger going up a few times. Oh, <laughs> sorry. You know that <laughs> they are my disconnectors. Sorry about that, Pankaj. So please consider my last previous comment as the second last, and this one as last. I want to take the opportunity here while our our CS Betty is here and and the ministry people are there from uh, Mr. Zirulin from Ethiopia and and government officials that this is the time now that we should you know uh, you know maybe it's a harsh word but we should come out of the notion that we are a developing country you know we should uh, or a continent we should believe in what our per capita income is and try to make tailor made solutions for ourselves. instead of looking up to the the solutions which america has or europe has with per capita income of $50000 we have a per capita income of $1000 so we should now start looking at the solutions our key need here is create jobs jobs and jobs and, and formal sector jobs so that you know then all the linkages can be developed so i am really really hoping that this whatever it's a very bad time right now it it is challenging for everybody and and though we are hopeful but you know it's not going to be a easy walk we need to start thinking on a multi level multi and do multi tasking on policy making and strategy making on the bounce back so i am really hoping that you know the governments will start looking into tailor make solution for africa for the countries and try to integrate countries you know in and and for example we're talking about the free trade right now on table already already approved is the sadic tripartite agreement with eac and comesa we should push to open that start implementing so that the markets are at least open within those 650 million people which are now gone now can be duty free to each other so so many things are there communities countries especially the africa union needs to start working together stop thinking that we can continue doing uh, you know the same thing which other is doing so kenya is very strong in apparel manufacturing we have the experience we have the skill and everything maybe ethiopia has better cotton farming uganda tanzania all of them have good cotton farming kenya is also trying to develop but the focus is that we can create equal jobs in farming as much as in apparel and then we have the linkages like textile and all that 
So we start thinking on those grounds and just focus on jobs, jobs, and jobs, because we don't want this health pandemic to become a, a social pandemic, you know, later on. And, and, and at the same time, when, when a jobless becomes hungry, it is a serious issue for the country. So we, we need to start thinking on those lines. And I'm sure we are talking here. And, and if, if all the countries start talking to each other, that will be helpful for us. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Pankaj, for these words and actually also for mentioning the cotton growing part. I think that is the part we didn't touch upon so much today, but it's also, of course, a very, very important. So, ladies and gentlemen, I really would like to thank you that you joined us today. I thank all the panelists. I thank our partners, the India ITME Society, City. Come at Gamma. And of course, I also thank our donor, the UK government. So thank you so much. I wish you all a wonderful day. Goodbye. We are closing this webinar now. Thank you. Thank you.